the modern affluent society sort of can have just what it wants. It's got some idea that the old cars, this feeling the old cars, they say they're, they're not made like they used to be. And I can honestly say that, in all fairness, there's nothing so good as a modern motor car. I mean, some of the old cars were good, they were excellent, they had a charm of their own, but there's nothing like the modern motor car. Like furniture design and architecture, the shape of the motor car pinpoints its place in history exactly. For many people, owning or restoring a classic car is to possess a time capsule of a bygone era or cherished memory. Amongst the rotting Austins, Cortinas, Anglias and Morrises in Bob Wilkinson's Breakers Yard, are the cultural cues of Britain's recent history, from the austerity of post-war rationing to the sexual liberation of the 60s. You leave me if cars are the archaeological relics of the era they came from, then Bob Wilkinson is the curator of a museum of rust. Most of these things are preserved in here because they're rare. This is a Humber Pullman, quite a rare one. And... Uh, several rover engines. Uh, we've just recently supplied one of the blocks of this type to a customer in America. Still in the block and crankshaft. Bob is a font of knowledge for any car produced between 1930 and 1975. It's a type that's been brought in quite recently. It's been lying out of doors for many years, but it's got a type of crankshaft in it that is very prone to braking. Some particular makes the, uh, there's a constant demand for a particular type of part, and we try to preserve those. These oily, mass-produced parts are gold dust. Here, a lot of... This is quite a popular shelf here. We always have people here, uh, the vintage racing people, looking for particular parts of our old SU carburetors. These are greatly needed. They look after anything to do with SU carburetors. They're very much in demand. And as you see on the floor, on the, you've gone back the gear wheels, for instance, take a part like this, is what they call a lay shaft cluster gear. It, uh, is, they're prone to wear shedding odd teeth if people are very rough. Then we look for the general wear on it. If it's not worn through the case hardening, it's as good as new, a part like this. It would cost a king's ransom to have one made. And therefore, it's, we have to retain, look after all these sort of parts. They're very valuable. This one's from a immediate post-war Austin from the A40, Devon, or Somerset types. Uh, very popular car in its day. The popular cars of yesterday become the popular classics of today, lovingly preserved in drafty garages in almost every corner of suburban Britain. For the last five years, Dave Marson's evenings and weekends have been devoted to restoring this Mark II Cortina 1600E to the condition it was in when it left the Ford factory at Dagenham in 1970. This is Ford the Mark II Cortinas were an important turning point for Ford in Britain. The car was the first model to shake off the American design influences imposed by the parent company. Put your foot down and demand performance. You'll get it in Ford Cortina. Still another way. Ford leads... The 1600E was pitched at a market segment of young, sporty executives with families. It was a car that was put in a niche in the market, if you like, between um, the Lotus Cortina and the GT. It's sort of a, a cross between the two, whereas you've got um, quite a fast car in the Lotus Cortina. It was a, a harsh ride and there was no creature comforts really. And your GT was sort of a lower market again. So th they pitched this in between, sort of at an executive market, if you like, with a bit of plush trim and whatever, sports wheels, but with a Lotus suspension. So you got uh, a nice sporty sort of ride um, without the hassle of a Lotus engine, which, which tended to be a bit of a problem. And it, it was quite successful. When I first started motoring, you bought a car, a second-hand car. 
first thing you did was change the wheels. You put a flash set of wheels on it because you only ever got standard wheels in those days. Um, you'd put spotlights on, reversing lights, wing mirrors and all this sort of stuff. When the 1600D came out, it already got it all. You know, so to me, there was everything in that car that I needed, that I wanted. It was quick, it got good road holding, and it looked very nice on the road. So, that was it for me. Dave's years of work have produced a car worth far more than its market value. But money hasn't got a great deal to do with it. Dave is happy in the knowledge that he owns one of the best 1600Es in existence, and a shelf full of concourse competition trophies. A concourse car is as, but no better than, it left the factory. This is, this is as spot on as you're ever going to get one of these, I think. Absolutely everything has got to be as Ford would have done it. You could have walked into a showroom 20 years ago and bought a car exactly like this one. Except it took me five years where it probably takes Ford a couple of hours to build it. <laughs> This is the Ford Anglia 105E. It was designed by a British team, but overseen by the American Elwood Engel. This amazing launch film, directed by Joseph Losey, kick-started massive sales of the car. In 1991, they're building them again, by hand. Once the supply of vital panels has dried up, it's companies like Classic Components of Keithley, Yorkshire, that must save the day. Here, nine skilled men, made redundant from Britain's declining engineering industries, help to keep parts of our motoring heritage alive. This is an Anglia's back valance panel. After appeals from its members, the owner's club has ordered a batch of 25. Classic Components Managing Director, Jeff Coates. We take the flat sheet and put it in the press towel and give it the first pressing, which does put some shape into it. We've got to take the edges off. It usually wrinkles round the edges. We've got to trim the edges off, which leaves you with something like that. We've got to work it by hand, fold the edges over, trim it off, cut the holes in, and we end up with a, a finished panel, which is more or less the same as the original. It was a matter of minutes in the factory down at Dagenham to, to press one of these. Uh, it takes us maybe from start to finish, in, including the tooling time, about an hour to make one. At an average speed of almost 84 miles per hour, Jim Clark in a Cortina wins outright and takes a first in class. Jeff Coates also specializes in restoring one of the instant classics of the 1960s, the Mark I Lotus Cortina. We've got to uh, cut out all the bad panels on the car. They, they've usually been welded up quite a lot in the past to get them through an MOT. We've got to cut all the rust and rot out of them. This has been done down this side. Everything's cut back to the good metal, and the panels are cut to fit and butt welded in and ground off, and you get as original as, as you possibly can. For Bob Wilkinson, parts that are as good as new are good enough. You get people that come and spend several days in looking round. They, uh, they're in, uh, they great, get a great deal of pleasure from rooting around and, and having a good look at the old remains of the old cars. Rooting around the rusty remains and congealed oil of a scrapyard is one of the escapist pleasures of the classic car buff. Somewhere amongst this lot, where the great rivals of the motor industry lie side by side in silent decay, are the missing links to hundreds of weekend restoration projects that will bring the past alive. Oh yes, this is a this is an interesting old car. It was an Armstrong Sidley Sapphire. They were quite a, they weren't a very they were not very numerous, but they were a car that sort of vied with the Jaguar in the day, a copy of the Jag in some respects, and uh, and it's in the present moment being dismantled by some chaps from London who are going to come down and uh, finish and take the engine and the gearbox and the back axle off it. They've already been and taken quite a few valuable bits off it. 
And uh, it is now waiting. It's, it is paid for. It's just waiting for them to come. I'm looking after as custodians. They come and take it when they can. The people that we sell parts to, it's people that owned the cars quite a few years ago and they would like to run one again. I think there's a lot of nostalgia involved in it. Today's cars are designed by a computer. The, the manufacturers now put all the information into a computer and the computer tells them what to make. Whereas years ago, uh, a little guy with a pencil would draw on his piece of paper and, and that's what they would make. Uh, it, more personal, more of a personal design, if you like. Which I think would go down well today, probably, with a lot of motoring public. To throw the computer out the window and give a guy a pencil and a piece of paper and say, they are now, draw me a car. <laughs>